Hey guys, one of my viewers mentioned they hadn't seen 10 Base 2 before, and I was thinking actually there might be quite a few other people out there that just haven't really seen it in the wild. So, I mean, back in the 80s and 90s, especially in the 90s I remember it, we had computer labs all lined up, you would just have a run of this running behind them all, and each one of these would just screw into each machine, and yeah, you would just have one cable going into your server room, and this is 10 Base 2. Now there's some disadvantages to it, I mean obviously it's it's only 10 megabits, I'm pretty sure it's limited to being half duplex, I'm not sure what the deal is with that, because there's only one signal wire in there so you can't expect too much, but for an old computer this is perfectly fine, you wouldn't use it on your modern gear, but for old equipment it works well, and the main reason I love it is that single cable into the server room, I'm not running 20 ethernet cables just so some vintage computers can share some files occasionally. So I like 10 base 2 a lot, it's also very handy when you want to use original hardware, like rather than using a card from the late 90s, maybe something like this Novell NE2000, you want to use that. You have got two options, you can use a transceiver on that AUI connector to change it to 10 base T, but you can also just use the BNC uplink. So I'll just try to get that on camera just so you guys can see how that goes on. Just push in and then rotate and now it's locked and yeah I can hang the card off that, it's not coming off in a hurry. Perfect. Now it is just a different wiring scheme, so there's nothing special, this is normal Ethernet. You can Anything you could do over 10 base T, you can do over 10 base 2, basically, well, except for maybe the duplex stuff, but it's the same thing. So you run the same software, there's nothing amazingly different, it's just a different wiring system. So instead of each computer having its own cable all the way back to the switch, um, with this stuff you don't even need a switch, or well, you can, but you don't need one. Um, just all the computers just link up through these coax connectors. Now being coax, you do have issues with reflections on the cable, so you will need a 50 ohm terminator on both ends. The other thing is I'll just make sure you get cable that's rated for 50 ohm use and um, not some old TV cable or something, because I'm not sure how that affects the signal, but these are sold as 50 ohm coax, so I imagine there's a reason for this. Not 100% sure, don't care, I just order the right stuff. Now one thing is when you're ordering this stuff, if you are getting it from China, um, I would recommend buying a lot more than you need because I did find that some of my gear turned up and didn't work. So this black cable here is an AliExpress special and this white one is old stock. If you can get old stock stuff, definitely recommend it. The terminators I use are all old stock. The stuff that I got from China was just so flaky. I had some where the resistance was completely wrong. I had some where it was, there was no resistance at all. Um, I had a couple of T's that didn't actually have any connection going on inside. And with this stuff, if any part of you do that, your network on both sides is pretty much going to fail because it's not terminated properly. So each piece of your network needs to be running right. So it's a good idea to do one machine at a time and check the network still operating in between so that you can identify any faulty parts before having to undo the entire thing and work it out piece by piece because I've been there and it can be quite frustrating to be honest. You have to do it piece by piece. So there's some obvious reasons there why this is no longer used today. Um, but still, for retro PCs, I find it really handy and really easy to deal with. So I just have this running around the workshop now. Now, of course, you are going to want to hook up your 10 base T PCs. Maybe you've got a modern PC, maybe you want to get out to your internet firewall. The really easy solution for that is a lot of hubs in the early 90s and even the late 80s would have had both. Um, if you look at them, they just look like a normal switch, but on the back, there'll just be this one little BNC connector, all lonely. And you just plug a T and a Terminator right on the India network and away you go, the two networks, it's the same network, it's just a different wiring scheme and that's how you can attach them between each other, which is really handy. Um, so yeah, so 50 ohm terminator, each end, get proper 50 ohm network cables and T's. Now one other thing, um, if I haven't mentioned this already, the T does need to be on the back of the network card, which, I mean according to the spec, I'm not sure if some offices back then actually had the T's in the wall, but you generally wouldn't do that, it's supposed to be like this, so that's how that works. Now on some uh, network cards you will also have to jumper or configure them to use the BNC connector. Um, one of the cards that I had before was actually quite funny, it refers to the BNC connector as cheaper net, I guess it was considered to be the poor people's option at one point. Um, it's also regularly called thin net. And I quite often see this 10 base 5 AUI type stuff referred to as thick net. Um, with 10 base T, it just, I don't know, I haven't seen any cute nicknames for that. It's just called either UTP or 10 base T. But yeah. So that's 10 base, t 10 base 2.
and you see I've actually got it running into the back of this Toshiba here. Most of my machines I try to put in one coax connector because I like to be able to network them occasionally. It's a good way to transfer files. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I just remembered one thing I wanted to mention. You yeah, a couple of 486s. I'm going to play Doom Multiplayer. LSL, a driver for your network card, the ODI driver, run OPX ODI. One length of coax, two T's, two terminators, multiplayer, no hub, no switch, no extra plug pack. It's quite neat. But yeah, I'll have to do that at some stage on the channel. Anyway, thanks heaps for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. I've got some interesting stuff coming up. I've got a Model 3286 that I've just basically replaced everything on. And what else have we got? I have to do work on a Commodore 386 SX25 because it's missing its internal battery and I'm not 100% sure on whether the keyboard interface works because I haven't actually tested it yet, but a bit sketchy and we've retrovided the front plate of that so that should be quite interesting to take a look at as well. I've got some footage on that. I want to do more on the desoldering station that I got here, I want to actually review that and I've got a whole pile of things. If you guys have some ideas, I've got these two dual Pentium 3 450 servers, no idea what to do with them, they work perfectly fine. I mean, I can put Linux on them, but what do you do with a dual P350, uh, 450? I mean, I can run Windows NT Workstation, but I'm trying to think of a practical use where these machines might be able to help me in the workshop, but I'm not quite finding a solution. Um, they are cool little machines, and dual Pentium 3 450s is pretty awesome, but I mean, games and that sort of stuff's not really going to support it. I mean, the best I could think of is if you put Windows XP on it, maybe I could listen to music while playing a game. But that's about the best that I could come up with. At any rate, they've been tested, and I'll show those off at some stage soon. So, thanks for watching, guys. See you next time.